Aloha mai kako, and welcome to the session of Brown Bag Biography, the longest running seminar series at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. This is Brown Bag number 772. It was started in the mid 1980s by the Emeritus Director of the Center, George Simpson, um, and it is currently being run extremely ably, especially in the transformation over to Zoom mode of our graduate student, Zoe Sprott, and our managing editor of biography and the manager of the Center, Paige Rasmussen. Um, before I introduce the person who is going to introduce our speaker, I'd like to just uh, mention a couple of things about what's coming up. Um, next week, we'll be having a session, same time, same, uh, uh, same link, uh, which Zoe will be putting up in the chat, um, a session called Voices of Hawaii, Life Stories from the Generation that Shaped the Aloha State by Jane Marshall Goodsell. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the name Goodsell. It's one of the names on one of the foremost law firms in the state. And she is uh, from that family and also uh, has been very much part of the scene of the shaping of Hawaii over the last 50 to 60 years. It's an incredibly wide range of politicians, entertainers, businessmen, legal people. Um, and what she's brought these together into a collection of narratives, which of course we're very interested in because as Candace and I were just talking about sharing and receiving other people's stories and being able to acknowledge their existence is actually at bottom one of the things that actually makes research what it is. Um, she will be speaking next week. The week after that, there will not be a brown bag because that will be spring break uh, at the university. Uh, there are a number of sessions coming down the road. And if you want to find out about them, Zoe has just posted all the material for linking to those. Uh, we have people like Anjali Roy and uh, Aiko Yamashiro are going to be presenting in April. And there's quite a number of sessions that should be very interesting to people. Um, the other thing I just want to mention is that um, many of the sessions this semester and Candace's peripherally, uh, peripherally, although Candace is very definitely central today, um, are tied to the kinds of ongoing discussions that are represented among other places in the recent edited collection, Value of OA3, Hulihia, The Turning. Um, a number of our brown bags this semester have been tied to that and coming out of that. Um, it's an edited collection of about 65 to 70 uh, prominent, interesting, and uh, wide-ranging voices uh, engaged in thinking about what the future of Hawaii is going to be like after the kind of catastrophe we've been dealing with over the last while, and hoping that that future will not just basically be a return to what happened before in previous catastrophes. Um, the big thing we did to make sure was that this book is free and available. It's published by UH Press. And if you want a paper copy, you can buy one for, I think it's $25. But it will always be free and can be downloaded at any given time. So that uh, link is also there so that you can get a copy of that. And the whole reason for it is to engage, stimulate, and continue discussions across the board about what the future of Hawaii might be. Um, with that, I would now like to turn things over to Professor Cynthia Franklin in the Department of English, who will be introducing our speaker today. Thank you. It is a huge honor to introduce my friend, colleague, and writing companion, Candace Fujikane, and her tour de force mapping abundance for a planetary future, go out and buy it, Kanaka Maoli and critical settler cartographies in Hawaii. It's such a pleasure to have the opportunity in a public setting to appreciate Candace and the enormity of her accomplishments. I wish we could do this in person with lay and cake and champagne, but that will come. I've seen Candace's book take shape in a number of ways, which account for why Noe Goodyear Kawapua has called it on the back cover medicine and masterpiece. First of all, her earlier work, which has paved the way for this book, provides as good a way as any I can think of to map what, had, what it has meant over the past few decades to be a settler aloha aina. Mapping abundance is an is accumulation of this process, which of course is ongoing. And here I know Candace is already well underway with her next book. 
Second, Candace and I have been in a writing group for over a decade, and I saw this work in its earliest iterations. We also have done writing check-ins for the past six plus years, and these have been daily on Candace's part and not so daily on mine. Um, and I have never ever known someone to work so hard on a book or to put in so many hours, often day after day in the double digits, giving meticulous care to each and every detail in terms and also in terms of craft. And I think her descriptions of land and her use of metaphor just grow ever more breathtaking. Her attention to relevant scholarly sources and theories, and most of all, in terms of her responsibility to the Aloha Aina whose stories, Ike, and activism her work lifts up. Third, I have seen Candace in action doing decades of community work that have fed this book and that this book will also help feed. And there's a good reason the um, Association for Asian American Studies gave her their 2020 Community Engaged Scholar Award. Mapping Abundance is a community production that results from relationships Candace has forged with cultural practitioners, farmers, fish pond protectors, soil scientists, hydrologists, geologists, geographers, cartographers, archeologists, attorneys, artists, and kupuna. I've gone on a number of environmental justice bus tours with the concerned elders of Waianae and have seen Candace take on increasing responsibilities as she has learned mo'olelo about the land and political strategies from these elders. I have visited Mauna Kea with Candace, where she shared with me some of the teachings from Ku Ching and the many others um, from whom she has learned the ways of water and land, and with whom she has chanted and stood in protection of the Mauna. I have been stunned on any number of occasions by the power and precision of her testimony as to protect sacred cultural sites. She has shared Mo'olelo and environmental impact statements and called to accountability settler colonizers valuing capital over land and water. I have also not seen Candace when she was off getting arrested while opposing construction of the wind turbines in Kahuku, or writing grants for Kahea, or organizing the annual Environmental Justice Day in Waianae, or speaking at the Ea Educational Weekend Annual Event in Makaha, or working with the group Kalihi Calls to archive a living map of Kalihi Valley, or helping to restore Kanaka Maoli lifeways in her own home of Heiea Uli. And this list could go on. Mapping abundance comes out of all this work. It dazzles as it connects the dots that can join Candace's decades of involvement in community land struggles, her deep listening and learning, and her time intensive and remarkable development of multiple areas of scholarly expertise. Um, for example, Candace has learned to make her own maps, to track the science behind the Mo'olelo that has sustained Kanaka Maoli, for millennia, and she has given up nights of sleep to study Olelo Hawaii in order to make responsible use of Hawaiian newspapers and other archival materials. Um, Candace doesn't sleep very much. <laughs> um, mapping abundance is truly the work of a life deeply committed to the value of indigenous knowledge and sovereignty. It is a book whose abundance is beautiful, brilliant, imaginative, and bold. And most of all, born of Candace's love for this place and those whose stories and visions it maps with reverence and wonder. And finally, during a time when to survive, we all need to learn from and honor indigenous ways of knowing. This book offers us all a hopeful vision for how to thrive and realize already existent abundance-filled relations to land, skies, water, and one another. This is the most beautiful monograph I have ever held in my hands. It is also the first that has felt like a prayer and a ceremony to bring its readers into balance and beauty. As I turn this brown bag over to you, Candace, I want to thank you for mapping um, so abundantly for us all for a planetary future that you have gifted to us. Thank you, Candace. Thank you for such a beautiful introduction, Cindy. I'm trying not to cry because I cannot be blowing my nose when I'm talking, so. Thank you so much. And, and I also want to say that um, Cindy was really <laughs> someone who reached out to me and um, who helped to pull me out of a pit of despair when I was when I had this kind of a writing block. And um, so I am so grateful. I am so grateful. Can you hear me now? Uh, Hank, can you hear? I see Hank's message. Is it good now with the um, can you hear? Yeah. OK, so um, uh, yeah, so. 
Okay, good, good. So I hope my, um, my um, I forgot to plug in my headset, so we're good. So thank you so much, Cindy. Thank you, Craig, and thank you, Zoe and Paige, for um, organizing this brown bag, inviting me to speak. Uh, I really, really appreciate it. And um, I am so happy and overwhelmed to see um, so many of you who are actually in the book here today. And I just thank so many Aloha Aina who shared their stories um, of how they map their land struggles to protect the land and how to pass on uh, this knowledge to the Kula Kula. Um, really, for me, this is my ho'okupu to the Lahui. And um, it's, it's a very humble one. It's very small, but um, it is, uh, you know, out of this great love that I have for the, the Lahui. Um, so the title of the book is Mapping Abundance uh, for a Planetary Future. And the title grew out of a remark that David Lloyd made at a critical ethnic studies conference. And he argues that capital fears abundance capital fears abundance. And, and I just love that. I just love that. And um, it fears abundance because abundance feeds and capital relies on creating um, the impression of scarcity in order to produce markets. So if capital fears abundance, then the best thing we can do is strike at capital where it's at the weakest, right? By doing precisely what it fears and making that abundance visible by mapping it. Um, I'm thinking of also of Pono Ke Aloha always talking about capitalism, right? It's the capital, it's capital and capitalism. Um, but Kanaka Maoli cartography is a cartography of abundance. And um, actually, I'm going to start uh, sharing with you the opening of the book. Oh, I'm sorry, not this one. Let's not do that one. Let's share screen here. And here's uh, my PowerPoint. And let me just make it full screen there. And I'm gonna to go to the next. So um, this is um, from the opening of the book, the very first page. And um, this comes from, the opening comes from Moses Manu's uh, recording of the Mo'olelo of Keao Mele Mele and the migration of the Mo'o to Hawaii from their home islands in the clouds. So here is the opening section. One of the most visually stunning illustrations of a Kanaka Maoli cartography of climate change is the oral tradition describing the migration of the Mo'o, the great reptilian water deities from their home islands in the clouds to Hawaii. In their lizard form, the Mo'o are formidable beings measuring 30 feet in length. In their Kanaka form, they are irresistibly beautiful women and men with great power known to string yellow ilima flowers into lay while sending themselves on rocks in pools of water. They are also desiring women known to seduce men and to kill their lovers. If mo'o are depicted as elemental forms to be feared, it is also because they are the awe-inspiring protectors of water. Um, in the mo'olelo uh, of mo uh, keo mele mele, mo'o inanea, the matriarch of mo'o deities, gathers her family of Mo'o to accompany her from their cloud islands of Nu'umealani, Ke'alohilani, and Kuaihilani to Oahu. They arrive in the Ehukai or Pua'ena, the misty sea spray of the surf at the jagged lava cape at Waialua, and they make their way to the dark waters of the long and narrow Uko'a fish pond, where the Aka'akai bulrushes and the uki sedge stir uh, with plentiful fish. And then across the windblown plains of Lauhulu, perhaps to the Kaukonahua stream, and from there to Kapuka Ki. Ua hiki mua mai oia ma pua ena waialua. I am a laila konawahi ho'onoho ponawai i kana hua ka inui. Oia ho'i ka hua ka i o na mo'o. I am a kekula o Lauhulu ma waialua. Ua pani pa'aloa ia ia wahi e na mo'o. O ka hiki mua ana ke o nā mo'o kupua ma ke ia pai, ai, pai aina, ma muli no ia o ka make make o ka mo'o i nā nea, a pene e ma popo ai ka nui o nā mo'o. Ua ho'onoho pālua ia ka hele ana o ka huaka'i o ka makamua o nā mo'o, aia i ka piina o ka pūkā ki, 
a o ka hope no ho i aia no i lau hulu. A mawaina mai o ke ia wahi mai waia lua a ewa, ua pani pa aloa ia e nga mo'o. So Mo'oina Nea arrived first at Puaena in Waialua. There she arranged a great company of lizards. The plain of Lauhulu in Waialua was covered with them. This was the first time that the supernatural lizards arrived on these islands. It was through the will of Mo'oina Nea. This is how we know the number of lizards. She set them two by two in the procession. When the first of the lizards reached the incline of Kapukaki or Red Hill, the last ones were still in Lauhulu, and between the two places, from Waialua to Eva, the places were covered with lizards. Uh, from these words, we can imagine the stately procession of Mo'o. So I'm gonna just, um, this is a little Mo'o from my home in, um, let me see if I can move this down here. I don't have that interrupt there. It's a little high there. <laughs> okay, um, from my home in Haiku. Um, but um, you can imagine 30 feet um, in length, these mo'o, um, their great tails sweeping from side to side, flickering between their reptilian forms as enormous lizards and their human forms as fierce men and women making their way across the plains with the Ko'olau Mountains misted with rain to their left and the cloud-covered summit of Ka'ala in the Waianae Mountains to their right. The Ivikua Mo'o, or the continuous backbone of Mo'o in this procession, foregrounds the Mo'oku Ohau, the genealogy of Mo'o Inanea's line as they surge across the island of Oahu, making visible the continuities of water. So, um, I did do a, a, a kind of map. Oh, so it's always complicated with this thing here. Oh, okay, there we go. Um, so this, uh, I, I uh, plotted out what I think is the path of the Mo'o on this geological map of Oahu. And what it is, is um, you can see that this is the Ko'olau volcanic series and the Waianae volcanic series. And where they meet is an unconformity or a depression that creates the Kaukonahua stream. So I figured, okay, the Mo'o wanna travel along the water, paths of water. And so this is the approximate route I think that they took. And what it does is it shows how all the waters of the, the waters of this side of Waianae and this side of the Ko'olau all meet together in this one stream. Okay, so, um, and then visually, this is what it looks like from Waialua all the way and in this corner here um, behind this thing is uh, the um, image of, um, you can see Diamond Head or Leahi. Uh, and the reason why I start with this image of the Mo'o, I explained that it could have signaled a moment of a climate change event when there was less water. And so there was a necessity for the coming, the migration of the Mo'o to Hawaii so that the Mo'o would protect the waterways of Hawaii to make sure that the waters were never being taken for granted. And um, what I love about it is it's an image, a very powerful image of the continuities of land and water, which is what capital tries to erase. Capital tries to make it seem like places are disconnected from each other. It fragments places into smaller and smaller pieces that are no longer culturally significant. And here's an example from White and I that um, uh, illustrates that. So, for example, this is um, uh, this is in Lua Lua Le, or this, this property is called Nanakuli B. So this um, land here, just and I had it outlined earlier, but I think I forgot to upload the wrong slide. This land here actually has a 150-page cultural impact assessment. Okay, it's this very tiny area, but it has 150 pages outlining its cultural impact. This area here only had a 15 page cultural impact assessment. And it was because they said that they couldn't consider anything outside of the boundary lines. And that is how the state and developers work. And the problem is that um, the cave of Hina is actually on this side of the map 
Um, so this is actually an incredibly important historical um, and culturally important place. But this illustrates the mathematics of subdivision. So Mo'o'aina takes us into a more integrated conception of the continuities of land. Okay, And I use that also to talk about in the book in chapter one, um, Mo'o'aina as a concept to think about places in Hawaii as all connected to each other so that a devastating impact in Red Hill will impact something that happens in other parts of Honolulu, right? The, the leaking jet fuel tanks will have an impact throughout the, the areas that are fed by that aquifer. And what this shows is a mo'o'aina, is, it's a smaller land division than an ahupua'a, but to me it represents pilina or relationality um, and this is a beautiful map. This actually is a map of mo'o'aina of three different apana or sections of uh, uh, three different mo'o'aina. And what it shows us is that um, there are not, um, the borders are not boundaries of separation, but seams of relationality. So it shows us what is bordered on each side of um, this mo'o'aina. Yeah, for example, um, uh, this particular um, uh, apana three is an avava volke moka, so an avo um, um, avoke valley inland, and it's bordered um, moka by the pali or the cliffs um, on the ever direction by the cliffs of Kiilaukulu, and um, in the Waianai direction by the Kulapili or the grassy plain, and oh, excuse me here on the Mauka, Makai, Makai section by the Iliaina. Uh, Kaolai. So anyway, this is how we found the birthplace of Maui. So this is the map we use to find Kaolai, which is the birthplace of Maui. So it's Land Commission Award 3131 uh, as a Mo'o'aina map. Uh, well, and here's a, a, a kind of closer detail of the description of this Mo'o'aina. But um, so given that background and the context for the book, I want to move on to talking about Haumea. So it is, as I mentioned on Facebook, kind of a daunting task to say that you're going to talk about Haumea, but I'm just going to do my best to share with you the stories that Aloha Aina, who live in the lands below the cliffs of Paliku, how they have, they have shared with me, and also the kind of work that I've done in trying to connect their struggles. So Haumea is the Akua, who is the principle of regeneration. And I focus on the mo'olelo of Nakino Lehulehu o Haumea, the multitudinous bodies of Haumea, as beautiful women armed with kukui nuts, packing the lands fronting the cliffs of Paliku, now known as Pualoa. Haumea also takes the form of mo'o. She takes the form of the mo'o kamehal ikana in Kalihi. And as we will see today, the form of hauvahine at Paliku. She is the multitudes of mo'o who protect the waterways of Kualoa. As Hau Haumea extends her yellow hau flowers along paths of water and the alo or the face stones of the ancient lo'ikalo and lokoi'a who are now being awakened from their long sleep as mahi'ai and mahi'a return to plant kalo and cultivate fish once again. So in Hawaii, uh, mapping abundance has everything to do with the akua. And as Pualani Kanakaole Kanahele explains, the akua are better defined as, not as gods, but as elemental forms or natural processes. And so when we are mapping places, we are mapping the 400,000 akua or elemental forms that are specific to every place. Um, each place having its own rains, its own winds, its own elemental phenomena. Laka, for example, as the um, Papaku Makavalu researchers have explained, Laka is the process of evapotranspiration. According to Moses Manu and Kel Mele Mele, there are 405 different cloud formations, and there are hundreds of different, or maybe thousands of different winds and rain specific to their places. Um, and these are all considerations that go into the mapping of places in Hawaii. And um, since this is a talk for the Center for Biographical Research, um, I'm thinking about cartography as the biography of the Akua. 
um, describing the struggle over lands and waters in Wayahole and Heia, I focus on the cartography on cartography as a biography of Haumea. So Haumea is preeminently the consciousness of the earth. Um, she is also the akua or the elemental form of abundance, the great deity known for having many kinolo or bodily forms, transforming herself from old age to youth as beautiful women across generations. Kanahele tells us, quote, Haumea is the Hawaiian domina dominant matrix of all things born, end quote. And she continues, quote, in the Kumulipo creation chant, Haumea is the most significant female form endowed with fertility and procreative power, end quote. The 13th va or era of the cosmogonic chant, the Kumulipo describes Haumea's paliku genealogy. So in the Kumulipo, her mother is a Kahaka Wakoko and her father is Kulani Ehu. Life writing scholar Marie Alohalani Brown also points to one genealogy of Haumea being both Punalua and daughter or granddaughter to Mo'oinanea, the great matriarch of Mo'o. And we see this in the Mo'olelo of Okelenuia Iku. Kalein Uhiva has the most beautiful descriptions of Haumea. Um, in a video, it's called um, Haumea Establishing Sacred Space. Um, and she uh, talks about Haumea as potentiality. Nuhiva is the Papaku Makawalu researcher whose primary discipline is Papahulilani, the study of the atmosphere, including its phenology, energies, and cycles from a Hawaiian perspective. And here is a beautiful, beautiful part of her talk on Haumea. So, quote, Haumea is really the potential for something to happen. One of the things that she does is called Kahea Haumea. The Hea Haumea is actually a net that she took care of. And what she would do is she would cast it into the sky so she could plot things. She plots genealogy. She is the one who creates the potential for things to happen. So if you imagine the image of the net and it's bringing together four different strands, what, you, what do you have in the middle there? The hipu'u, the image of the knot. That is the imagery of potential. That is the honua that's being created for the proper thing to happen. So one of the things she does is she casts that net into the sky and she plots out all the stars in terms of time. It's providing the potential for all of us to move forward for all that needs to be done. We replicated in the net that stretched over the umeke as there's water in the inside. She's talking about the ipuho okeleva'a. Um, so we can plot out the stars because each of these hipu'u, these potentials will line up with stars that are up in the sky. That's the ipu mauloha or the net filled with food that is often found in different ceremonies. So Nuhiva goes on to explain that Haumea is both the careful plotting of known factors like genealogy um, and the, the changing positions of the stars in the sky to mark time. But the Hea Haumea is also about the potentially, potentiality of future generations. <clears throat> and I wanna connect up to this idea of the Hea Haumea um, another concept that Ho'ulu Aina program coordinator Puni Jackson describes uh, a similar concept, the upena nananana apapa. So um, in the mo'olelo of Wake and Haumea living in Kalihi that I'll be talking about today, um, the upena nananana apapa is the spider web of Haumea in her form as papa. The mo'olelo recalls for us that the wonders of Haumea are re remembered in the kuali'i chant O papa la hoi kananana, o papa unoa a ava ava a kua. Papa is the spider, papa of the burning muscular back. Um, and Jackson explains, Rubelite Kavena Johnson talks about the way that papa holds up the web of stars and all cosmology, like the tracking of the sun. It's basically a spider's web that the heia are aligned to, every ahu is aligned to a certain way so that they can be true directionally. The spider's web is tracking, it's helping us to track celestial bodies. So it's a very, um, I think this is really important um, as I go on talking about um, the heia haumea and the upena nananana apapa and thinking about branches of hau. 
So Haumea is also the elemental form who presides over birthing and from the different parts of her body, she births the deities and um, some of them are mo'o like kamohoali'i. Um, so I talk about the different places in Kalihi um, that are the children she births from the different parts of her body. And so um, given all of this under this, this broader understanding of the expansiveness of Mo'aina, the relational land divisions that stretch out across the islands and the earth. Um, it also represents a way to map abundance through envisioning the expansive cascading effects of restoration. So one of the important points I make in the book is just as a devastating, um, uh, let's see, there's an inverse, I'm oh, sorry, uh, just as environmental degradation caused by late liberal settler capital has exponential effects on contingent ecosystems and inverse is also true, localized environmental restoration also has exponential effects. So talk about the cascading restorative effects. So you have one damaging thing happen and it spreads out to all others, but in the same way, something restorative in one area, like a fish pond has greater implications uh, way beyond ways we can imagine. So the regenerate, um, this regenerative Haumea principle, um, we think about how she re uh, Haumea returns again and again, renewed to youth. And um, I think about the Mo'o procession as the, the, the path of these hau flowers across the island. They're indicators of water, so they often uh, grow along the banks of waters. They also form. They also have a protective role um, in terms of protecting the lokoi'a and also protecting the ancient lo'ikalo that are still in place. So um, I want to move on to the mo'olelo of um, Haumea and um, Wakea. Um, the first part of the story traces their lives at Kalihi and it also um, shows us the emergence of uh, the um, Haumea's form as Kameha Ikana, the breadfruit tree, uh, and also the Mo'o who is Kameha Ikana. Um, and then uh, they, excuse me, they um, enter into war with Kumuhono. And Kale Nuhiva describes this as kind of a battle between the um, an older line and a younger genealogical line. Uh, and the part I want to focus on today is when they take the battle to Paliku. So in an astonishing um, turn, oh, and, and I'm sorry, and this Mo'olelo ran uh, in 1906. And um, Haumea and Wakea escape through the portal of the breadfruit tree, and they make their way up to Kilohana, uh, where they live, and Haumea knows that war with Kumuhonu is upon them, so they amass their forces on the Ko'olau side of the island. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, in an astonishing turn in the Mo'olelo, we see the wonder of Haumea multiplying her body into thousands of beautiful women who pack the plains before the cliffs of Paliku. So um, <clears throat> uh, for example, okay, so this is a passage from the Mo'olelo. <clears throat> Excuse me. I ka ne'e ana mai o ka ehu o ka ua, malalo mai o ko'olau loa, a pela no ho'i ka ehu o ke kaua, ma ko'olau poko mai, ua ike maila na kanaka i ka pa'a pono o ke kahonua, mai uka aku nei o kahi i kapa ia i ka ike ia wā, o ka, ka ahu ula punawai, a hele a ho'ea i ka lai o ka o iyo. I ka pa'apono i nga wahine me nga hua kukui ma ko la ko maulima. O ki a po e wahine a nei po e kanaka e iki aku nei oia na kino lehulehu o haumea. A oia no ke kumo o kona kapa ia ana e wahine kino lehu, kino, kino lehu, kino mano, a kino ho pa hao hao, ho pa hao hao ho i. Okay, so as the, this is the translation, um, as the dust clouds of the warriors were moving in below from around the Ko'olau area, likewise, the dust clouds of the warriors from Ko'olau Poko were also moving in 
and they saw people completely covered the flatlands below the cliffs inland of the place now called Ka Kaahuula Spring, Kaahuula Spring, extending to Kaoio Cape, completely covered with women with kukui nuts in their hands. These women that the people were seeing, they were the multitudinous bodies of Haumea. And this is the reason why Haumea is called the women of the multitudinous bodies, the numerous bodies, 4,000 thick and wondrous bodies as well. So like the Mo'ohu Pani Pa'a or completely cover the plains from Waialua to Kapuka Ki, here too, the bodily manifestations of Haumea as beautiful women Pa'a Pono completely cover the plains of Kualoa. Uh, and this is just a beautiful um, repetition of that phrase Pa'a Pono, which intensifies um, that kind of vibration really. So in this beautifully choreographed scene of battle, the movements are mirrored. Kumuhonua's warriors surge across the Ko'olau lands, and this is met by the ne'e of the women warriors toward them. And uh, when Kumuhonua's warriors see these women, they send messengers to ask for the whereabouts of Wakea, and they are answered by He Wahine Ha'iya'i, a woman bright as the moonlight, who tells the messengers that their war leader should go back home. Uh, when the messengers convey this pakike uh, or sassy reply, the pukawa or the war leader underestimates the formidable forces of Haumea and orders the warriors to proceed. The women act with, with swift and deadly force. Ekiava wa poene i ne'e aku ai o kamanawa no ya i lele mai ai na hua Kukui mai na lima mai o na kino wa hine lehu lehu o haumea. Oya no oe o na poka ua hekili e pa ana ma na lai o kapoe koa nei o kane kumu nua. Pa no ka hua kukui i ka lai o ke kanaka lave ka hanu i ole pau. He hua kukui ka mea nana i luku Ina po e kanaka la a oya ke kumu a puka ai ke iaho o puna o lelo a kahiko. A hu a lala kukui kamake. So at this time, these women also surged forth, and the kukui nuts flew from the hands of the multitudinous women forms of Haumea, thundering hailstones that struck the foreheads of the warriors of Kane Kumu Onua. When the Kukui nut struck the foreheads of the people, the breath was taken to Olepo. It was a kukui nut that destroyed the people, and it is the reason this old saying emerged the dead were scattered like kukui branches in heaps. So the Mo'owahine let fly the seeds of Haumea's potentiality against Kumuhonua's warriors. These seeds then take root in these bodies and grow into groves of kukui trees that flourish across the lands of Paliku, now known as Paliku, again, Kualoa, memorializing the numbers of men who underestimated Haumea and were killed. So how do we know that these wahine forms of Haumea are also mo'o? I mean, we know that, we know that, but there's also um, evidence in the mo'olelo itself. Um, so this is how my research happened. So my kumu oli is a'ia ibelo, and I read this, when I first read this passage years ago, about the wahine a'ia'i, I teased her and said, oh, these impudent women who tells Ku'ohonua's men to turn around and go back home, that's you, a'ia'i. And um, the woman whose face shines brightly like the moon. And then today, she sends me an oli by Kihe de Silva called Ulupo Nui with a note that references a'ia'i as an epithet for hau wahine, the guardian mo'o of kawai nui. So um, he says the sheen of her skin was compared to hala i'o. So that's from Kihei de, Kihe de Silva. And so we see the mo'o hawahine in this body of woman, women protecting paliku. So when we map the Haumea story on the ground, um, you know, we can see that this whole area was just packed with um, mo'o who became the bodies of water multiplied across the land the, um, the mo'o as the guardians of the streams, springs, and other bodies of water. Yeah. And um, what this also uh, reminds us is that 
there are kanavai of the Akua. And in the Edith Kanaka Ole Foundation report, Ki Ho'i Ho'i Kanavai, oh, I'm going to share that here, uh, which is uh, an amazing uh, publication uh, on restoring Kanavai for island stewardship. They identify 21 vow or horizontal realms of island stewardship. So five units of vow lani, the atmosphere in the skies, 10 units of vow honua, the earth, six units of vow kanaloa, or the deep consciousness of the ocean. And two of the four kumu kanavai, are the, or the fundamental ecological laws, focus on, uh, let's see, this one, ho'okiki kanavai, the edict of continuum. Forces of nature and cooperation uh, for continuity and flow so that magna moves, water runs, rains fall, air and ocean currents are unobstructive and, and ferns kupu. Uh, oops, sorry. Let me see, I'm gonna move this on the side. And the island body persists. It's the law of continuum. And the other law that I see this mo'olelo establishing is uh, ki ho'i ho'i kanawai, the edict of regeneration, the greening, the greening of, sorry, I'm reading this part, of a new flow by hiaka, restoration of landscapes, when all the opportunity, land, ocean, and kanaka return to health. Uh, it is the law of regeneration. So this is really important to be thinking about. These are the laws of Haumea um, at Paliku, um, the edict of continuum, the edict of regeneration. And I wanted to um, illustrate how that those edicts or kanavai are violated by what um, settlers, settler developers, ranchers, um, corporate interests have done to waters in Hawaii. And that is the diversion of water from their natural flows, their natural continuum, the natural flows. This is a map that really um, shows us, oh, and I don't, I don't have the note on it. Um, this is a map of Waianae. And um, you can see how it's a mapped, uh, map of the theft of water. You see all of these water tunnels diverting water from streams and from springs. And then you see these lands formerly in taro. And this is really important documentation of lands that were forced fallow because of this violation of the kanavai of the akua, um, the violation of the continuum of water. And um, I have, so many stories to tell you and um, okay, but I'm running out of time. So I'm gonna save the story of this map for later during Q&A if you wanna know more about this map, I can talk more. In similarly, um, the violation of Haumea's Kanavai, we see this in with the Waiahole ditch irrigation system that diverted water from the valleys on the, uh, on the windward side of the island to um, feed the thirsty plantations in central Oahu. So this is an ongoing problem. I just saw the, the ditch in uh, Mililani, but this is a, a, a violation of Haumea's laws. And underground, you see how they have these boundaries as if water cares about boundaries. And actually what they're doing is changing the paths of water, yeah? Okay, and um, these are the Kalopa'a o Waiahole. These are the people who are the hard taro of Waiahole. They are the water protectors. And so um, I wanted to, to, I wanted us to think about all of these Haumea bodies in front of the cliffs of Paliku and to think about these water protectors of Waiahole who stood, um, and this is a painting by Meala Bishop called um, Kalopa'a o Waiahole and it traces the history of the water, the fight for the return of land and the fight for the return of water. And in this particular image, we can see the, um, Kalopa, the Kalopa'a o Waiahole, the people standing in front of the Waiahole Poi factory with their arms raised. So this to me is reminiscent of all of the Haumea bodies standing for the protection of water in front of Paliku. And we can even take that further to Mauna Wakea and Mauna Wakea, as we know, is a source of water through fog drip. And these are the, um, the protectors of water who stood and faced law enforcement. And there are numerous images 
of these lines of protectors, right? Um, these are the children, and this is a, a, a piece of artwork by Heli Ka'ili'ehu called Kahuliau. And these are the lines of protectors. So again, thinking about Koaloa and how Mea's women bodies standing for the protection of the water. Here are all of the protectors. Now this formation was based on the Kumulipo uh, representing the 16 eras of the Kumulipo. There were supposed to be 16 lines going up to the Mauna, but um, we were able to stop the construction crews from going up to the summit of Mauna Oakea at line 11. Um, and this is the, the Wahine line, the very powerful Mana Wahine line. And at the very top of the line were the Kupuna Pohaku, the Kupuna who asked to be put into the, to be planted into the road to stop the construction crews. And this is also a mapping of this protection of water that reminds us of Haumea and it reminds us of the procession of the Mo'o across the lands to uh, protect the bodies of water and Mauna Awakea. And we know of the kupuna who made the decision to protect their descendants by standing on the front lines at uh, Mauna Awakea. And this is also another line of protectors uh, in 2019. So um, now I'm going to take us to, I know I'm trying to hurry through this last section, uh, which is really cool because um, thinking about what's happening with Haumea today. And okay, I'm gonna just check my time. Oh my gosh, okay, so I'm running out of time. I'm gonna go really fast, okay? So this is how Haumea continues to protect um, lands in Hawaii. Um, although many people think of how as invasive, it is actually protecting these ancient lo'ikalo walls. So Danny Bishop took me into Punalu'u and we were able to see all these ancient walls. He's cutting his way we, you know, through this, um, all of this, we can think of these branches like the Heiau Haumea that have been cast over these lo'ikalo, protecting them from ranchers all these years. And I have beautiful quotes from Kanaloa Bishop and Danny Bishop describing how the Ho is what has protected these lo'ikalo, the alo stones from being trampled on by the ranchers cattle. So that the, so we can think about the ho is protecting lo'ikalo and at the lokoi'a, um, this is um, haleo meheanu and the, all of the kia'i or they are called um, mahi, mahi'i'a. So they are the fish cultivators at Paipai Ohe'ea, um, hi'ile kavelo and um, kili'i kotubate and also um, all of the many other um, people who work there. Let's see, I'm trying to go forward really fast to um, that section uh, with, uh, so Kanaloa Bishop, Kinohi Pizarro, Mamo Liotta, Kiahi Piohia, uh, Ikaika Wise and Pula Malong. They're all working to cut down these mangroves here and to replant hoe because um, the mangroves are clogging the streams, which are necessary for regulating the temperatures in the fish pond and also for uh, oxygenating the water. And so they have these chants uh, about um, meheanu. Um, and as um, Hi'ile Kavelo explains, meheanu, Haumea is meheanu. She is one of the mo'o who stood right there along in front of Paliku. So they are burning down the mangroves to restore the fish pond and growing hao will be central to that restoration. Okay, so I kind of whipped through the ending. Oh, and I also did wanted to mention that there's what uh, Hi'ile Cavello calls the uh, corridor of Haumea, which is the, um, the the yellow hao flowers growing from restoration project to restoration project from uh, Heea all the way up to Kako'o Oivi and Oivi and um, to Papahana Kuaola over the Ko'olau to the Ho'olu Aina and all the way down to Ho'ola Ke'ehi. So we see that yellow path of restoration of Haumea and regeneration, restoring all of these lands back into uh, food production, back into growing kalo, back into fishing, uh, growing fish. Yeah. So mahalo. That was kind of a whip through. Uh, <laughs> I guess I have so much to say and there's so many stories and I just love these stories. So mahalo.
Oh, mahalo, yeah. Oi. Um, that was great. Uh, I want to make this as available as possible to people. Well, the option here is you can either put your question in the uh, chat, and I will pass that on to Candace, or she can read it there. Or uh, the other possibility is, if you'd like, if you could raise your hand, uh, Zoe will actually activate your camera, and you'll be able to ask her the question or make the comment directly. Okay. Ask me super hard questions so that I can write or I can think about the answers for the next book. <laughs> okay, I'll start. <laughs> this is a tough one. Okay. Um, what I'm really, uh, what I'd like to hear about because you've been working so heavily, you've clearly, you've been at Bureau of Conveyances, you've been through basically all of the kind of major archives and whatever, and you're emphasizing so strongly the issues of continuity. Uh, you know, those stories heading back, uh, the origin stories, the arrival stories, the, 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 the sort of peopling with a kua kanaka, and so on and so forth. I was wondering if you could just comment about to what degree, because all of this stuff is mediated by things like the Mahele and then after territorial thing and the uh, territorial matters, and of course, a tremendous amount of erasure. I was just wondering if you could comment some on the difficulty, the challenges and the joys of trying to, in some ways, translate those erasures to recognize the presence within territorial documents, late kingdom documents, state documents, to see that that continuity is there. Okay, yeah, that is a that's an interest that is a very good question. <laughs> so there's a lot of frustration in this work in the sense that um, um, so place names get written incorrectly, um, transcriptions differ, so you often have to cross reference documents. So native testimony, foreign testimony, you have to cross reference the documents to see you know what the changes have been. And we couldn't find the place of Maui's birth because the name was written differently and on maps, they're written also differently. So Ka'o, uh, in Kamakau, it's Maui was born at Kaolai, um, Kaolai, um, and then in um, on the map, it's listed as Kaolai, you know, so the erasures happen all, sometimes inadvertently through the transcription of the words. Um, there's also missing maps, which I am very suspicious about, like all the hydrology maps are missing from the Land Survey Bureau, <laughs> or many of the hydrology maps are missing. And, you know, those are the key maps that tell us where water is. So there, there's, uh, you know, there's those kinds of struggles. Um, territorial period, I'm just trying to think, like, um, I, I don't know that I've come across those. It's just that maps change over time. And so I go to the um, Land Survey Bureau, uh, the Land Survey um, map search, and um, you always have to look at the earlier maps because over time you see how land was lost. Um, a lot of information is on the very, very old maps. They're actually beautiful old maps the, in there. Like there's one on the Mokawea fisheries that gives the names on the places on the reef uh, for places like um, that, that tell us where the eels were or where you could find, um, where you could find different, um, of, you know, those shells the, the, with the soft meat inside. <laughs> So um, they're like resources, there are a lot of resources, but you know, they're buried in there and you have to um, always magnify, magnify, because sometimes the print is so tiny, you, you would easily miss something. So I was looking for Kaolai for a really long time and it turned out I had the map on my desktop for two years. Um, so th there are all of these differences and I have to say, and I wanna say this, I feel like spirituality is also a part of cartography. So I always pull it and um, at, to me, that helps me to open my eyes to find things. So, um, so I do ask for guidance. I do ask the kupuna to guide me, to help me to find information. Like the whole thing about uh, you know, telling me about um, Kihei de Silva's chant today. Like, I mean, talk about coincidence, you know, and how there's this very specific um, reference to um, Hevahine ai ai in this particular mo'olelo. So it things happen through relationality, 
through the relationships that you form with people. And so if I have difficulty finding something, um, I'll just ask people. And sometimes they just have these amazing archives um, in their homes, or they'll have a chant that explains a, a particular phenomenon. So, um, you know, I, I think that there are these technical difficulties that you're describing, but if you have faith in the Akua and you um, ask that knowledge be revealed, I do feel like it happens. Um, and, um, and it's also through the relationships that you grow with other people in sharing that information. And, you know, when I interview people, I tell my students that I don't just take from them, but I try to give something in return, whether it's a copy of, uh, like I'll photocopy out of print books uh, to give to people I interview or any documents that I find I'll share with people and that to me is a more kind of um, you know uh, a more reciprocal exchange of knowledge um, I always try to give something back uh, maybe it's labor uh, maybe it's assistance whatever but is that I know that's a little it's a little different from your question Craig I can't I'm just trying to think what were the specific difficulties, um, just a lot of misspelling or, and especially when, okay, so this is a, a good thing. Okay, let me say a good thing. The USGS maps, you know, often misspell Hawaiian place names. And that's a very good thing because then places can't be found. <laughs> <laughs> so it sometimes works um, to our benefit um, that place names are not revealed, especially ones that are particularly sacred. I can think of a lot on Mauna Kea. There are many, many place, place names on USGS maps that are, that are wrong. So anyway, uh, I don't know. I can go on and on, but I have, there's a question from there's Ty. Other questions here. Yeah. yeah. Well, Ty's question is, did you ever come across anything about the Hale Hau, which is a healing house made from Hau? I saw it in the dictionary and was wondering if there were more mo'olelo on it. I have also thought about the potentiality of how as a concept for transforming anthropology. Any ideas on how how <laughs> it, can, it can be used to articulate new methodologies or theories in your numerous fields of scholarship? Oh, I, I love that. I love that. I think the idea of the how, uh, the heya haumea, um, I'm thinking about them as how. Um, you know, that that's to me very um, fruitful. That's very generative. I've never seen anything about the Haleho. And actually, when I was trying to find things about, you know, Kinolao and Ho, um, Lu Lupea came up as one of Hina's sisters who takes the form of Ho. And it's just Lupea. Um, and no real stories about Haumea as Ho. But to me, you know, uh, it's almost because it's so it's almost so obvious, perhaps, you know. Um, so how vahine, thinking about how vahine as well as a mo'o. Um, I don't know, potentiality of how. How was used also to um, condition the soil. Um, Danny Bishop talks about how um, how was planted to rehabilitate soil after it was, um, it, it, when it was, uh, laying fallow or what it was uh, what you call it when you make it fallow for a bit or you you just kind of <laughs> let it rest and I know the how has that kind of regenerative properties uh, and the how is also um, the sap from the how is used in childbirth um, and that's partly that connection I think to how um, but uh, okay Kant how is a concept for transforming anthropology I think you have something specific in mind that I think sounds really fabulous, Kavika. I don't know if you wanna kinda <laughs> elaborate, elaborate on that. I don't know, I just think hoe is just super fab fascinating because we go and we cut down the hoe and it just entangles. Okay, so there are all these stories about hoe. I'm sorry, just going into stories about hoe. How hoe was a place to conceal illicit love affairs. So on Maui, there's a Olelo no Eau about, um, and I can't remember it off the top of my head, but it's about concealing illicit love affairs. So Ho can also be seen as perhaps a methodology of protecting certain information until it's ready to be revealed, perhaps. 
And uh -huh. Tevita Kaili has put in another meaning for how is ruler or champion based on the Proto-Polynesian word thau. Is it possible that the hau in haumea and hau wahine may also mean rulers? Yeah, that's entirely possible. I mean, papaku makawalu, you look at all the possible meanings of a word and all possible implications. But yeah, I kind of like the idea, right? Of um, I kind of like the idea about um, how protecting information until it's ready to be revealed by the right person, maybe. Um, you know, Danny Bishop um, is just kind of going with a machete through the hoe um, to reveal what's lay, laying underneath for so long. And all those alo stones are finally feeling the sun and the rain on their faces. So it's kind of amazing when you think about that. Okay, other questions or comments? And Maya is saying, uh, Uncle Kihei-san, Mapuna Kahala o Kailua also talks about Ai Ai, so I gotta go check that out. So yeah, the one that Ai Ai sent me was Ulupo Nui. I was like, wow, really beautiful. All right, Hank has a question here. Um, <laughs> I think you'll have a few things to say here. Have you more information regarding Hawaii Island? We are trying to restore Hamakua District. Maps? Yeah, because Hank has this other one here. When working with Kahuna Sam Long, he spoke about Pu'uhonua Lehua that spans from Mo'okapu across to the point of Paliku. There's a triangulation from Mo'okapu Pyramid Rock to Haiku Valley to the point of Paiku. And I live in Haiku Valley. So the, well, not further in by the highway, but towards the mouth. The steering of energy took place from Mo'okapu, but could have but could move energy mass also from the gravesite of Auntie Emma de Fries, Valley of the Temples during the evening. You can see the giants turn into mo'o as they enter the ocean. Oh, Hank, that's so beautiful. Bono. Um, so I could, that would make so much sense that there is a triangulation from mo'o kapu to, um, so I'm trying to remember the, um, Oh, I'm sorry. Let me just look really quick at the, the other name for uh, Paliku is, uh, what is it? Kapu Haloa, something Kua Kapu Ohaloa, Kua Kapu Ohaloa, or something like that. It has something to do with the sacred back or sacred Haloa. Haloa, what is it? Yeah, Kamo'o Kapu Ohaloa. Kamo'o Kapu Ohaloa. Yeah. So Noi Noi Silva, because Noi Noi Silva writes about um, this Mo'olelo too, and she has this really beautiful kind of reading. Um, I actually really like your reading, um, Noi Noi, about the Kalihi part and the Maia. Um, there's a really interesting kanavai that Haumea hands down about the Maia. Um, the, so Wakea was um, captured by Kumuhonua's men for eat or collect gathering the, the wild bananas. And Haumea is asking the farmer Kali'u if he thinks that that was a just reason to capture Wakea. Um, and um, the farmer says no, because he knows the land. And she says that no one who has, um, uh, this is Puni Jackson's reading, no one who, whose hands have worked in the earth can be denied the foods that are, that grow from the, the Aina. But, um, but, um, Noi Noi, you talk about this too. Do you want to say something about that part, Noi? Noi Noi? I don't know if, uh, I don't know. Okay. I think, you know, it oh, okay. might possibly be the issue of security. She might, she might type something in. Oh, okay, okay. Sorry, sorry about that, Noi Noi. Oh, no. But that's a beautiful, um, I love your read. This is in uh, uh, Power of the Steel Tip Pen. Um, and she has like this really beautiful readings. Uh, beautiful readings of that mo'olelo. Because that mo'olelo um, is not <coughs> translated into English. And uh, again, my olelo Hawaii is very new. So I've been studying for six years. And yet I'm very slow at learning a language. Oh, OK. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Haumea throws a pohaku to, this is uh, 
wow, Pohokaina Cave. Wow, wow, that's a really cool name. Uh, that's the, yeah, that is all the, I don't know if you guys saw the movie, um, Finding Ohana. Yikes, yeah. Um, okay, so Haumea throws a pohaku to open the spring below Kuakini Bridge with Kali'u. That's why Kali'u is also the Ili name uh, there. Yes, so it's um, Pu Ehu Ehu, the Pu Ehu Ehu Spring was created by the, so this is a really cool part. Haumea, ooh, okay, this is another cool thing about Haumea. Haumea chants to her Pali ancestors, her Kupuna Pali, and she chants to them to shake and to shudder and to move. And then the big pohaku um, flies into the sky and creates the spring pu ehu ehu. But the chant there is so beautiful where she invokes her, her, um, kupuna, or her um, kupuna pali. So her pali ancestors. Um, I, I love that part. Um, that is just kind of, that's like mind blowing, yeah. <laughs> So yeah, and so I don't talk about Pohukaina in the book because I didn't want that to be, you know, I just didn't want that to be, um, that's, there are a lot of things that I don't talk about in the book, anything that was kapu, uh, I only talk about things that are noa, either because it was either published previously or I was given permission to share the story, so um, that's also another part of cartography, I was trying to be careful about knowledge you're entrusted with and knowing when not to share certain things. So um, uh, you don't want people to go and def des desecrate desecrate the, the, these places or the state to remove all signs of these places because the state doesn't want or the developers don't want these places to be uh, remembered. There's a lot of, there's actually a big struggle going on at Paliku, right, with um, John Morgan, who's the descendant of the Judd family, and the struggle of the people to recover their uh, Ivi Kupuna in that area. Oh, okay, here. Uh, the tree they entered to escape was eventually turned into the Gab Kameha, Kameha Ikana, yeah, known as a form of Haumea, yes. And actually, oh, Oh, uh, Aloha Lenny Brown, Marie Aloha Lenny Brown's book will be out. And I know she has a passage in there of this epic battle between Kameha Ikana and um, Lani, Lani, Lani Huli, the two mo'o fighting each other. This is super exciting. So I'm super excited. Her book's coming out next year, January, January, 2022. And we're all waiting for her book to come out so that we can you know, learn more about um, the Mo'oya. And very thankfully, your book is now out and available to everyone. It's Duke University Press. There are all sorts of different ways of getting a hold of it, and I encourage everybody to do that. It's clearly a major contribution as we move forward. I'd like to ask Everybody, oh yeah, uh, and while I'm just uh, finishing up here, Zoe, could you put the link to Duke University Press up in the link? Yes, she's already on it. All right. So anyway, I would like to thank everybody for attending. As we were saying earlier, this is the biggest attendance we've had at a brown bag in the last year, and the attendance has actually been higher over COVID period than it was earlier. We were up well over 80 at a certain point today. So at any rate, if you could all uh, join me in thanking Candace and uh, wonderful presentation. Thank you.